is invention of novel energy sources that are not that are not only renewable but also neutral for uh, the pollution which are carbon neutral basically in the synthesis of renewable and carbon neutral fuels as well as degradation and mineralization of various kinds of pollutants released by industrial vehicular and domestic emissions biotechnology has proved has proven to be an extremely efficient and effective tool microbial and uh, microbial and enzymatic processes uh, with different substrates have offered an alternate route to the conventional processes such as catalytic fuel synthesis or advanced oxidation processes like fenton reaction that are not only energy intensive but also use harsh chemicals with, and which have significant side effects in many cases the bio processes have also yielded numerous value added side products that could be source of additional revenue thus bio processor biotechnology has potential of opening new avenues in sustainable development so in this session we shall have a glimpse of the state of the art research in application of biotechnology for green fuel synthesis and bio remediation so we have five eminent speakers in this session from renowned institutions in india who will present their research in application of biotechnology in energy and environmental engineering okay. so our first speaker is uh, uh, professor parag gokte from department of chemical engineering of uh, institute of uh, chemical uh, technology uh, he will be speaking on intensified production of biofuels from sustainable raw materials using ultrasonic reactors i'll uh, briefly give a bio sketch of uh, professor gokte he is a professor of chemical engineering at icit mumbai and he is a versatile chemical engineer with research in the area of use of alternate energy sources process intensification waste water treatment and converting waste into value added products professor gokte has contributed extensively to publishing in journals of high repute with over 300 international journal publications along with 15500 citations with eight index of 67 and 25 chapters in edited books dr gokte has active consultancy projects with many national and international industries and also collaborations with many research groups worldwide dr gokte has contributed extensively to development of the profession by virtue of organization of refresher courses seminar for participants from academic institutions and industries and competitions for student community he uh, is a fellow of indian national academy of engineering and institution of chemical engineers uk so i request professor gokte to uh, deliver his talk okay uh, thank you vijay for uh, that quick introduction and also introduction to the session so the, let me just start uh, uh, start the talk and i'm going to talk on intensified production of biofuels from sustainable raw materials using ultrasonic reactors and since the theme is on biotechnology i am going to talk about the enzymatic routes of conversion and then how intensification using ultrasound can be achieved in this uh, so i'll briefly cover the basics of uh, ultrasound induced cavitation and then what uh, are the expected mechanisms for intensification i'll briefly focus on the, the research done in the area of bioethanol production and biodiesel production i'll quickly highlight uh, other application areas for ultrasound induced intensification uh, so biofuels uh, all of you know there is always a energy demand and uh, depletion of petroleum supply is basically driving the interest into alternate fuel it of course depends on the uh, price of the, the petroleum products and if the uh, petroleum products are shooting like 100 dollars a barrel definitely the interest is going to be there in biofuels but yes these are considered to be environmentally friendly and also good alternative and typically gives you lower emissions which can lead to greener environment the enzymatic route for biofuels uh, basically are biological catalyst and it offers again a green approach for synthesis uh, but the inherent disadvantage of any enzymatic process is the slow reaction rate and typically higher cost of enzyme so definitely you need to look at some process intensification approaches which can lead to intensification of these enzymatic processes so as to make them commercially viable and higher costs of enzymes also mean that you need to recycle the enzyme back and 
typically there should not be any change in the activity of the enzymes because typically it might happen that with use the activity of enzymes is going to go down and hence you need to effectively plan for approaches which can give you minimal loss of activity and then the recycle is going to be proper. So with these two main limitations, uh, we have been trying in terms of using ultrasound as a way to intensify the process, especially overcoming the slow reaction rates. Typically, what uh, happens when you are having ultrasound into the system is that you start with a nuclei, which is generally present in the form of uh, uh, dissolved gases in the system. These nuclei are going to go in an expansion phase, reach a maximum radius, and then undergo a quick collapse phase, releasing significant energy, which is going to be accumulated during the expansion. So typically, if I look at the key effects in cavitation, you have high intensity turbulence, increased transport coefficient, and you can also generate highly reactive free radicals with localized intense pressure and temperature condition. So if you combine all this, you can actually get an order of magnitude reduction in the energy requirement for physical or chemical transformation. Now, it is very important to note that depending on application, any of these uh, mechanisms are going to control. So in the case of biofuels and in the case of enzymatic reactions, definitely we do not want highly reactive free radicals to be generated in significant quantum because the enzyme itself might get damaged. And also, it needs to be a the moderate intensity of cavitation. So the operating conditions definitely need to be controlled so that you can get the desired effects. At the same time, your enzymes or your reactants or products are not going to be harmed at all. So in the case of biofuel production, typically we say that the physical effects in terms of turbulence and increased rates of mass transfer typically govern the intensification and chemical effects like reactive free radicals or localized intense pressure and temperature conditions typically need to be minimized in this case. So the selection of operating conditions is going to be extremely important. But yes, depending on application, you might have some situations where your chemical effects are also going to be dominantly required. Typical advantages of using ultrasound, you can get reduced reaction times, improved yields, you can also get reduced quantity of enzymes. And then finally, if you combine all the intensification together, you might also get a reduction in the operating costs. So bioethanol and biodiesel are the two the main types of biofuels which have been uh, uh, kind of considered in this particular study. So typically bioethanol is going to be derived from uh, uh, sustainable biomass. So Lignocellulose biomass, some examples are given, West newspaper, you have a lot of agricultural residues. Typically, that can be converted into bioethanol, and each of these sustainable biomass would always have some proportion of lignin. So, for example, West newspaper typically has 23% of lignin, which needs to be removed, and then only your cellulose and hemicellulose will be easily accessible and that is going to give you the required conversion to sugars. So any particular uh, production route typically starts with a pretreatment with an objective of removing lignin. Then you have the hydrolysis of the pretreated biomass and then the fermentation, which is going to give you finally bioethanol production. So each of these steps is itself a, a kind of limited by mass transfer and hence you can use ultrasound in all these steps leading to a overall intensified roots. So this is just a simple illustration of how you can uh, do an alkaline pretreatment and then uh, it basically requires uh, an alkali solution and a dual agitator. This is the conventional form and this can also be intensified using ultrasound when you can introduce an ultrasonic horn. Of course, this is going to be a typical lab scale design. And when you want to scale it up, of course, the scale up methodology will be different and that needs to be evolved. But while presenting the results, uh, I'm going to just present the lab scale results, which of course was done by one of the PhD students here. So this is a typical setup for alkaline treatment. And this is a typical setup for ultrasound assisted alkali pretreatment 
where you are having an ultrasonic horn which is introduced with through one of the openings and this is your ultrasonic horn the agitator of course will be required um, because the mixing which is going to be generated by agitator will always be required considering the large sizes of uh, and the large quantum of solid material which you are taking a uh, typical comparison has been shown um, so it's only under kind of optimized parameters but uh, definitely you can see that ultrasound assisted uh, uh, process gives you significant delignification and typical acm images uh, uh, have kind of allowed understanding the mechanism so the structures typically get opened up and then you have large access of your alkali and your intensification is occurring so just to compare uh, you can get the benefits in terms of lower alkali concentration which is required the reaction time also gets reduced and definitely you are getting a significant increase in the delignification and uh, the next step typically is hydrolysis and you can again see similar advantages so just to give you an idea about what level of intensification is uh, expected this comparative studies have been presented so again enzyme loading is reduced reaction time is reduced and you can also get an enhancement in reducing sugar concentration based on the use of ultrasound you can also apply ultrasound at uh, the fermentation level and then the biomass production definitely goes up and also the bioethanol production the kinetic parameters were established uh, based on the kinetic studies and typically you can get a intensified bioethanol production so again the acm images uh, typically allowed you to uh, identify the controlling mechanisms and there is a slight change in the morphology of the cells which doesn't get damaged but definitely it gives a large activity so that's what i said in the beginning you need to apply ultrasound so that you can effectively control the application and just provide some sort of stress to the microorganisms and they are going to behave efficiently of course this stress will have to be controlled because i do not want any permanent damage to the cells and then that is going to be very important so definitely this study has allowed to establish that west newspaper can be used as a sustainable source and you get uh, enhanced productivity of ethanol and uh, so that's was related to bioethanol you can also extend it to different lignocellulosic biomasses it's not that only west newspaper process can be enhanced so there were some studies done in a subsequent uh, research and that used peanut shells coconut coir and pistachio cells as uh, the starting raw materials and definitely the alkaline delignification was carried out and was shown to be intensified by the use of ultrasound so this comparison definitely allows you to establish that you get about 70 80% of delignification uh, based on the rate constants are also higher of course depending on the material the rate constant is going to change but overall the ultrasound assisted uh, process gives you higher uh, intensification and again the acm allows you to establish the controlling mechanism and the reducing sugar concentration also is higher in the case of uh, ultrasound assisted approach so typically it's about 1.75 to about 2.3 times higher and this indeed depends on the uh, starting raw material so definitely the things cannot be generalized in terms of the expected intensification so you will have to analyze it for different sources and then see whether the expected intensification is dominant using ultrasound so this is just to summarize Uh, some studies because we are kind of short on time so i just wanted to highlight only the key outputs from different studies so biodiesel again can be the synthesized using enzymatic transesterification and uh, ultrasound can again be used for intensification so typically these are the optimized conditions which were established in a detailed study but i just highlight the comparison so as to tell you the efficacy of ultrasound assisted approach so your oil to alcohol molar ratio typically the alcohol is taken in excess and then any excess of course needs to be separated downstream so definitely lower excess if it's giving you higher biodiesel yield then that's going to be advantageous so ultrasound assisted approach 
typically works at one is to three ratio as compared to one is to four in a conventional approach. Enzyme loading also is reduced. The reaction time also is reduced and you get a minor increase in the biodiesel yield as well. So definitely this ultrasound assisted approach seems to be beneficial for the transesterification reaction. And one more route where you can use uh, uh, biodiesel, produce biodiesel is based on the enzymatic interesterification, right? So this also is going to be one of the routes because you get triacetine as the product, uh, which has more value as compared to glycerol. So again, the reaction is proceed and you get similar levels of uh, intensification when you are using an ultrasound assisted approach. So same comparison is again shown. So biodiesel yield is also going to be higher. Uh, reusability of immobilized enzymes needs to be also looked at because of the cost. So there is a small decrease in the case of the relative enzyme activity starting with cycle number, but there is not much change when you are using ultrasound. So it's basically the problem with the biodiesel production route itself. And uh, there are some changes which are also happening in the structure that was uh, kind of recorded based on the CD spectra. But yes, there needs, uh, there needs to be a careful look at the activity of enzyme and see whether ultrasound is really changing or otherwise you can uh, kind of optimize the operating conditions, okay? So biodiesel production definitely can be improved in the presence of uh, ultrasound assisted approach. A time of reaction significantly drops down. Biodiesel yield is also enhanced, right? So the, in next two minutes or so only, I'm going to cover about possible other application areas for the ultrasound assisted processing or in general hydrodynamic cavitation also can be used. So you have chemical synthesis uh, in core chemical area where you have speciality molecules that can be synthesized. You can have applications in wastewater treatment. You can have applications in biotechnology, uh, which we have seen some of the examples here as well. And then crystallization is another very important area, especially for the pharmaceutical industry, because there the advantage is going to be in terms of getting the particle size distribution. Some of the quick kind of uh, uh, areas where chemical synthesis can be improved, you can get higher yields of reaction, switching of reaction pathways, induction period can be reduced, effectiveness of catalyst can be improved, in wastewater treatment, different oxidation of complex chemicals can be there. Biotechnology, we have already seen. Uh, polymer sciences also, you can see applications in terms of initiation of polymerization reaction. Some depolymerization reactions can be done. And there are many more applications like intensification of solid liquid extraction process. There are a lot of natural products which are going to be the available so that leaching can be uh, improved. You can get better yields in crystallization and so on. Synthesis of nanocrystalline materials, that also is a upcoming area. So just to conclude, the ultrasonic reactors is a novel approach for process intensification. Definitely we have seen a lot of benefits in biofuel production. Uh, the key benefits which you're going to get is reduced raw material excess, catalyst loading is reduced. Temperature of operation can be reduced. That's going to give you economic benefits. Uh, many proven examples on lab scale, and there are also some successful industrial scale applications, not necessarily in biotechnology, but in general, yes, say for crystallization, say for wastewater treatment, there have been some applications. And combined efforts of scientists, biologists, and engineers will be required to kind of harness this cavitation technology uh, in future. So definitely there is a lot of scope and, uh, and there needs to be sustained efforts so as to even take uh, it to commercial level in the area of biofuel production. Right, so that's it from my side and I hope uh, I have stick to time. Yes, it's about 15, 15 odd minutes, a uh, little bit more maybe. Uh, so over to you, Professor Mohalkar. So thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah that was a, a quite uh, informative presentation, Professor Gokte. You have covered uh, uh, various kinds of uh, uh, biofuels, uh, bioethanol, biodiesel, and biodiesel also through the two routes of uh, transesterification and interesterification. And in, uh, indeed, ultrasound reactors have offered a new avenue of intensifying these processes so that the 
no the um, basically you can have higher production uh, with uh, lesser capital costs so that is a major advantage of ultrasonic reactors well uh, i thank you for uh, 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 your lecture and now we uh, move on with uh, the next speaker uh, dr uh, parmeshwaran vinod Uh, from microbial processes and technology division csir national institute for interdisciplinary science and technology in trivandrum uh, he will be speaking on microbial biotechnology for sustainable development i will briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, dr binod uh, he is he is currently working as a senior scientist in microbial processes and technology division in csir niist trivandrum he received his phd degree in biotechnology from kerala university and then worked as a postdoctoral fellow in korea institute of energy research uh, in south korea and later on he joined as a scientist in csir niist his research interests include biomass to fuel and chemicals biopolymers and enzyme technology he has more than 120 publications to his credit he is a recipient of several awards and fellowships uh, and uh, he is also a national honorary advisory board member of, of center for energy and environmental and sustainability uh, india and the central office of executive of uh, central office executive of biotech research society of india so i request uh, uh, dr binod to uh, deliver his talk uh, uh, thank you uh, professor moholkar i hope uh, i am audible Yes. Yes, you are audible. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So, uh, thank you and very very good morning, all of you. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers and Professor Mohalkar for giving me this opportunity to present uh, in this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, and the, for the last uh, almost all of the four conferences, I have been attended the conferences and uh, uh, have an opportunity to present in this. So. basically i am from csir institute which is a csir national institute for interdisciplinary science and technology which is located in tiruvanandapuram and why i am working on the microbial processes and technology division where we are basically working on developing microbial based biotechnology and microbial processes for the production of uh, 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 high value chemicals and uh, uh, most of the major mandate of our division is the uh, the sustainable development by ut utilizing uh, regional resources so we are basically working on the utilization of uh, agro industrial uh, waste material as a raw material for the development of uh, uh, various fuels and chemicals so with this uh, short uh, introduction i am going to uh, 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 my presentation which is uh, uh, entitled as uh, microbial processes for uh, uh, sustainable development so if you see see the bio based uh, uh, chemicals uh, uh, potential can see for the last uh, 10 to 15 years there is a tremendous increase in the in the production of uh, um, uh, bio based chemicals rather than selecting a, a pure chemical processes so the chemical processes has uh, already have a lot of uh, uh, disadvantages like use of harsh uh, chemical catalyst or toxic chemicals so most of this uh, harsh uh, conditions can be replaced by uh, biological processes so if you see in the slides here the, the comparative analysis of various chemicals produced in the year 2004 and 2015 you can see that there increased the uh, there is a, a increase in the share of uh, various uh, chemicals like basic chemicals specialty chemicals polymers and fine chemicals uh, production through biotech biotechnological processes rather than using a, a chemical products if you see the uh, the the recent report on the in the global bio based chemical market which is a forecasted market uh, of uh, 2019 to 2028 uh, the, the, there is expected to reach the value of almost 32 billion us dollar in 2028 and uh, with a compound annual uh, growth rate of almost 14.5 percent and now you can see there are a lot of companies are shifting their chemical way of production to a bio based uh, production where uh, uh, they, they are aiming to reduce the uh, reduce the major um, uh, greenhouse gas emission and other uh, environment related issue and also to make a, a sustainable uh, development so uh, you can see that uh, there are several chemicals 
can be produced through bio biological route like uh, acetic acid, acrylic acid, butanol, then cellulose, ethylene, isoprene, lactic acid, then different polymers like uh, polyhydroxy alkanate, then uh, specialty chemicals and uh, uh, building block chemicals like 13 propendiol, propylene glycol, uh, succinic acid, etc. So the, so this market is actually tremendously growing and there are a lot of opportunities in future for bio-based processes for the production of high-value fuels and chemicals. So in, in our institute, we are working on various microbial processes for the development of various chemicals like building block chemicals like 1-3-propendiol and 2 5 furan dicarboxylic acids. And we are also working on uh, uh, different biopolymers like uh, polygamma glutamic acid, then bioplastic precursors uh, uh, like uh, silonic acid, uh, uh, GABA, putrescin, and then dietary supplements like, like uh, lysine, uh, selena protein. So all these chemicals have been uh, selected based on the, in the current drawbacks in the, in the chemical way of uh, um, producing these chemicals. And we are also utilizing the, uh, the agro-industrial residues as a raw material for the production of these chemicals. So in today's presentation, I will be concentrating on only these uh, building, building block chemicals, especially 1,3-propendiol and uh, FDCA. So 1,3-propendiol is an industrially important biodiol with uh, numerous applications. Uh, so it is an essential monomer to synthesize polytrimethylene trephthalate. And it is also used as other uh, applications like uh, polymers, cosmetics, food, and other, uh, other applications. So if you see the market potential of this 1,3-propendiol, it is attributed to a growth, uh, a market growth in personal care, cosmetic, and uh, cleaning products. And uh, the economies such as India, China, and Brazil offers a special growth opportunities, especially in the PTT market and polyurethane applications. So the major market drive, drives, drivers are the, the, the reduction in the greenhouse gas emission. It is expected that 56% less greenhouse gas emission through bio-based 1,3-propendiol production. And it is consumes 42% less non-renewable energy than petroleum-based PDO. And if you see the, the markets in earlier, in, uh, during 2015, there is only one company, that is a DuPont, which is producing 1,3-propendiol through biological method. But now in the last uh, four or five years, there are a lot of markets are coming, especially there are uh, Chinese, Chinese, China are playing a major role in developing a lot of uh, uh, this uh, uh, propendial processes and they are marketing in their market. So also there are Japan and Germany are also in this, uh, uh, in the new market uh, players for one thrift propendial. So the chemical method of production of one thrift propendial is early, early due to two, process, uh, two processes, deducer process and a shell process, where they are using a harsh uh, chemical uh, reaction and energy intensive processes. And uh, in 2010, uh, around 2010, the DuPont has come up with a biological process there where they are using an E. coli, a genetically modified E. coli for the production of 1,3-propendiol using glucose as the carbon source. So our approach is actually uh, in the DuPont process, they are using glucose, especially the corn starch. As a, as a raw material. But in India, as a country like India, we cannot use a food material for the production of this kind of chemical. So we are looking for uh, uh, the renewable resources, especially the, the waste agriculture residue as a biomass for the production of 1,3-propendiol. So the biomass we are milling and uh, we are uh, undergoing, uh, undergoing as dilute acid pretreatment. And the pretreated liquor, which is basically contain, contains pentose-rich sugars, will be utilized for the 1,3-propendiol production. Also, this 1,3-propendiol production is a biotransformation process where the, the crude glycerol, that is the glycerol is converted into 1,3-propendiol. And here we are using the biodiesel industry generated glycerol, which is actually a waste material from the, in the biodiesel industry, which, is, which we are using for the production of 1,3-propendiol. So this is the, 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 the difference between the DuPont process and our approach. So DuPont is using a corn as a, as a raw material, but we are using the biodiesel industry uh, generated glycerol as the raw material for the production of anthrop propendiol. And uh, we are having a, we, we got a, a, a potent isolate, lactobacillus brevis, which is uh, producing one trip propendiol. And the advantages of uh, this uh, organism is a non-pathogenic, autofloculating, and a microaerobic. 
So with this aim, we started a project for the biochemical conversion of 1,3-propendiol, where we are addressing both the upstream and downstream operations of bioprocessors. So uh, using various uh, uh, statistical optimization method, we we optimize the process for the, the production of 1,3-propendiol uh, from lactic acid, uh, lactobacillus brevis. And uh, once we optimize the process in the, in the laboratory scale, we trans, uh, transferred or we scale up this process in the, in the reactor scale. So starting from the, the, the small flask scale, we, we, we optimize the process in the three liter fermenter and finally we optimize the process in the, in the 20 liter fermenter, fermenter scale. And through this optimization approach, we could able to uh, get almost 50 to 55 gram per liter 1,3-propendiol uh, in, the, in the process. The another beauty of uh, this reaction is that we are getting another byproduct, which is a lactic acid, which is also a, one of the, uh, the uh, biopolymer uh, or one, one of the biopolymer that uh, or the uh, uh, biopolymer can be produced using lactic acid, that is a polylactate, which is also an advantageous in this process, which is a high value, high value polymer. So uh, uh, the major, uh, the problem associated with this uh, fermentation based process is the downstream processing because uh, once the, uh, the the fermentation upstream operations are done the the, the fermented material contains a lot of uh, water almost 80 percentage of water we need to remove in addition to that we need to remove the other byproducts like lactic acid acetic acid one term propendiol and uh, etc from the fermented drug so for this, uh, the separation of uh, one three propendiol from the lactic acid and acetic acid and other uh, byproduct, we used an aqueous two-phase extraction process where uh, potassium carbonate and potassium dihydrogen phosphate has been used in, in the process. And by this process, we could able to recover almost a 90% of the one three propendiol from the fermented growth. So this is the, uh, the finalized uh, pro uh, the process screen, uh, process scheme for the the production of 1,3-propendiol from the uh, from uh, agro-industrial residue and uh, waste glycerol. So in the scale-up process, what we found here is that the aqueous two-phase extraction process may not be a feasible approach in the in the large scale. So we are looking for other uh, operation of uh, other uh, operations like microfiltration, nanofiltration, and followed by flash evaporation or ultrafiltration followed by reverse osmosis process for the. Uh, the, uh, the the complete purification of 1,3 propendiol. So this work is we are continuing. So with this uh, um, uh, work, we could uh, found that the the 1,3 propendiol can be produced using agro-industrial residues through a biotechnological uh, process using uh, a, 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 through a, a sustainable uh, approach. So the the if you see the sort analysis of this process. Uh, our process is actually the strength of the our process is the we are using a wild type organism which is uh, generally generally regarded as a safe and uh, we are also getting a use very high uh, value pro byproducts in the in the process this is the strength of our process and uh, our opportunities are that this is an environmental friendly process and uh, as of now there is no companies or industries in India uh, producing one propendiol So there is a huge uh, potential for Indian market as we are looking for the Atmanarbar Abhiyan program. So there is a lot of opportunity for this process uh, to take up uh, in Indian market by Indian industries. So the weakness of this process is right now we are looking for an industrial partner and uh, uh, as of now, this, since there is no industries as of now in India and uh, uh, the, the problem with the, the startup is that this kind of process, the high capex is very high for uh, this uh, kind of processes. So we are looking for an established industries which they are interested into the, uh, in the production of 1,3-propendiol. And also we need to develop an efficient uh, downstream processing. And uh, the, the, the threat to this is that uh, uh, the, even though we have a lot of, uh, there are a lot of inquiries from foreign Players, especially we are getting inquiries from Chinese market for time transferring technology. So, but we should be very uh, careful and we are very cautious about the transferring technology to Chinese market. And uh, there is a lack of awareness in India about the benefit of uh, bio-based processes, even bio-based, not only one propendiol other bio-based chemicals. And as there is no strict, uh, stringent uh, government regulations are um, um, currently in, in India. So another uh, uh, chemical what we are looking is a 2,5-furan dicarboxylic acid, which is one of the high-value building block chemicals. And uh, the, the, 
lot of other biochemicals can be produced from this 2,5-furan uh, dicarboxylic acid like succinic acid, uh, then 2,5-hydroxymethyl tetrahydrofuran and other, other chemicals. And another advantage is our, another uh, opportunity is that the, the, the 2,5-furan dicarboxylic acid can be used for the production of polyethylene furanate, which is uh, projected to be the, the one of the uh, replacement for polyethylene trephthalate. Most of the PET bottles we can replace by this uh, uh, polyethylene furanate. So this is a, one of the future uh, high demanding market of uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the sustainable biopolymer development. So these are the, some of the applications of uh, this FDCA. This is used in polyester production, polyamides, polyurethane, and then plasticizers, nylon, and other, other, other things. So uh, here we, our approach is to use the, the, the agriculturally de derived sugars for the production of uh, furan dicarboxylic acid. So uh, he, for this, we screened almost 400 strains of uh, microbes uh, from the, in the Sikkim Himalayan region. And we found a potential isol isolate, Rhodococcus, which is able to convert hydroxymethyl furfural into uh, FDCA with almost 87 percentage yield. So this work we are uh, doing in a two phases. In the phase one, we are now developed a process for the conversion of hydroxymethyl furfural to furan dicarboxylic acid. And the next second approach is starting from the raw material. We are uh, looking for the conversion of this raw material, especially the, the, the glucose present in the plant biomass to convert into uh, hydroxymethyl furfural. So for this, we got an uh, acid catalyst which could able to convert the HMF to, uh, which is able to convert the uh, sugars to HMF with almost a 56 percentage yield. So this work we are uh, continuing. And uh, this is the first report uh, for the production of uh, furan dicarboxylic acid uh, using a, a, a bacteria which is belong to the, the genus uh, Rhodococcus. So we, uh, since this organism is not reported, so we, we are uh, now in the process of uh, finding out the, the pathway, how this organism is utilizing this hydroxymethyl furfural and into, into uh, the FTCA. And we uh, uh, analyze a lot of metabolic pathway analysis to see the, the, the intermediate product. And uh, this is the proposed pathway where the hydroxymethyl furfural is converted into HMF alcohol or it can be there is a, it's a bidirectional reaction where uh, in one direct, one way it can convert into HMF alcohol or it can convert into HMF acid and this HMF acid is converted into F F FFCA and uh, finally it is converted into furan dicarboxylic acids. So now we are looking for whether this work is continuing and now we are looking for the development of a complete process starting from the biomass to produce a biomass co conversion of these sugars from the biomass to uh, hydroxymethyl furfural and then conversion of this hydroxymethyl furfural into FTCA and finally the conversion of this FD FDCA into polyethylene furanate which is uh, which is one of the, the uh, one of the uh, potent uh, uh, bioplastic so with this i will uh, conclude my talk so microorganisms perform a diverse uh, role in our planet for the uh, the sustainable development of a sustainable ecosystem and uh, microbial approaches can be successfully used for the um, uh, the development of various fuels and chemicals in a sustainable manner and uh, lignocellulosic biomass also could be a potential renewable feedstocks to produce uh, uh, commodity chemicals in in sustainable manner so with this uh, i would uh, like to thank the organizers once again and Professor Mohalka, Professor Ashok Pandey for giving this opportunity to present in this conference. And I also thank my uh, students, Dr. Vivek, uh, Mr. Rajesh, and Gordon. Uh, they are involved in this work. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Vinod, for a very uh, nice and informative talk on uh, production of uh, different uh, value-added products like 13 propane oil and furan dicarboxylic acid from uh, agro resources indeed uh, uh, and uh, the mo uh, most uh, uh, important was that you covered both upstream and downstream processing usually i have i have seen in papers that people only report upstream process they rarely uh, deal with recovery and purification but in your case you have also uh, give, given us an account of that and uh, most uh, interesting feature of uh, your talk as far as my personal opinion is concerned is that you have very frankly uh, presented the SWOT analysis 
Okay, means it's not just uh, you know presenting only the green part of uh, this technology, but you have also given uh, you have also very uh, um, frankly listed the threats that are there for commercialization. So your talk will be very informative for uh, uh, those you know those uh, audience who really want to see these bioprocesses go uh, commercial. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vinod, for your thank talk. You. Then thank we you. move on. Our third speaker is. Uh, Dr. Madhuri Nara, uh, she is a principal scientist and head of bioconvergent technology division at Sardar Patel Renewable Energy Research Institute in the Bhutan Nagar, Anand, Gujarat. Uh, the title of her talk is "Development of Circular Bioeconomy bio Model for Rice Straw Valorization into Bioenergy Byproducts with Focus on Microbial Communities." I will give a, a brief uh, bio sketch of uh, uh, Dr. Madhuri Nara. She is a principal scientist and head of the bioconvergent department at, at Sperry. And she is responsible for planning, coordination, uh, and leads the research activities of bioconvergent technology division in alternate transport fuels from biomass, that is, gas and liquid, algae, and industrial waste sources through biological route. She has developed two processes as a lead scientist and applied for the patents for the same field level biomethanation plants based on kitchen waste, dairy waste, and fruits and vegetable waste were installed under her supervision. Uh, sir, we are not able to hear. Yeah, madam, we are able to see your, your presentation. Can you may start? Yeah. yeah. I, am I audible, sir? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, good morning much. to all. Very good morning to uh, all. Yes, yes, you are audible, madam. Yeah, very good morning to all. I take this opportunity to thank the organizers and Dr. Mahalkar for giving me this opportunity to present the latest research that has been done at uh, Sprary. Before I start my presentation, I'll take a few seconds uh, to introduce my organization. It is uh, shortly known as Sprary. It is in between uh, Ahmedabad and uh, Vadodara. And it's a 40-year-old institute established in 1979 by uh, late Dr. H.M. Patel, who was our uh, former finance minister and home minister government of India. And it's an NGO. And the vision of this organization is to develop environment-friendly renewable energy technologies through efficient, economically viable for society. And uh, if you see the structure of the organization, we have... Uh, uh, four divisions, solar, bioconversion, thermochemical, and technology transfer division. So whatever the research or the processes or the renewable energy gadgets that have been developed under these three divisions that will be taken to the end users by the, the fourth division, that is the technology transfer unit. So these are the few listed uh, uh, technologies we have developed under solar energy, bioconversion, thermochemical, and the extension unit. I'm not getting into the details of those now. And uh, I will be presenting the, uh, the latest research that has been done at Sperry. Uh, at Sperry, the team has focused on um, using the straw for biomethanation, that is for biogas generation. If you see that the paddy is cultivated in 43.9 million hectares, and uh, from this, 160 million tons of straw is produced. If you consider Punjab itself, the straw availability is 16.9 million tons, 
and uh, the because we know the open field burning because of the reasons one is the mechanical harvesting of rice crop and the second is surplus straw is available and there are storage problems and also the farmers are not getting the uh, money that they wanted to when they are selling the uh, straw but they are only getting it um, 500 rupees per metric ton and these are the reasons that uh, prompted the farmers to burn the straw and one third is being burned openly every year and because they wanted to keep the field for sowing the next crop ready. And there are uh, reports which shows that one ton rice straw releases three kg particulate matter and uh, six kg of uh, um, carbon monoxide and one six four six kg of carbon dioxide around 200 kg of ash and 2 kg of SO2. So government is looking for solutions for this trouble burning. And uh, there are very recently, there are reports have come up that uh, IARA, the New Delhi based organization, which have developed a capsule uh, con consisting of a microbial consortia, which can be sprayed in the field itself. And that takes 15 to 20 days to convert this um, straw into uh, the compost. So because of this unscientific and uncontrolled disposal of this or burning of these uh, straw leads to greenhouse gas emissions, we all know about that. And uh, people are started working on, people have worked on also converting this uh, paddy into uh, producing the bioethanol, that option has been already there. And um, the second option is that we will have also worked on biomethanation route, but that, that has been done in a batch mode, converting this uh, straw into biogas. Here I will be like focusing on, we have developed a process which is a continuous mode of, uh, in converting the enzymatic hydrolysate into biogas. So this is the process flow that we have adopted here and we have considered the rice straw as a substrate, then it was subjected to pretreatment and here we have used a mild alkali to break the lignin bond. Once that has been done, then the pre-treated substrate was uh, subjected to enzymatic hydrolysis here, and the produced sugars were used as a carbon source for biogas generation. So in this case, the anaerobic, the, the, the digestion has been taken place at uh, thermophilic temperature, and this is a patented anaerobic digester, and this is a design um, con developed and designed and developed by our institute. And we also studied the metagenomic diversity of this uh, anaerobic digester during the study. And we also uh, considered the solid residue which left after enzymatic hydrolysate was used for uh, solid biofuel production, that is pellets, which can replace the cattle dung cake or the wood logs where, for rural areas where they use as a C-type chulas. And we also did uh, considered the black liquor, which, which was generated during the mild alkali pretreatment for the extraction of lignin. And the extracted lignin was uh, again uh, used for lignin pyrolysis studies and its kinetics. And after the lignin extraction, whatever the, uh, the aqueous phase has been used for the presence of its metabolites. So this is a compositional analysis. Uh, by using the mild alkali, we could be able to uh, reduce the reduction of lignin around 60%. And uh, there is an increase in the cellulose content by 43%. And uh, there are uh, the enzymatic hydrolysis had a high content of COD, which is around 130 to 140 gram per liter. And it has a glucose 72 gram per liter, xylose 44, along with arabinose and cellobios were also there. And the, the pH of this hydrolysate is 4.73, but, but anaerobic digestion requires a neutral pH that is a seven. So therefore that has been adjusted to uh, seven to carry out the uh, anaerobic digestion studies. So we also analyzed uh, the enzymatic hydrolysate for other elements present in that, and uh, they were found to be within the suitable range for anaerobic digestion. And another important factor is the CN ratio is very important for anaerobic digestion, and uh, which is the range is uh, uh, 20 to 30. But whereas in this case, enzymatic hydrolysate had a 22.86 uh, so the CN ratio. So we have not uh, incorporated or supplemented any nitrogen or carbon, carbon source to maintain the CN ratio because see, nitrogen is very important for the protein synthesis and also for the microbial growth during anaerobic digestion process. Um, so this is a schematic uh, of the anaerobic hybrid reactor because it's a combination of uh, USB and the anaerobic filter. 
And, uh, and since we have carried out the experiments at 50 degrees centigrade, we have provided a hot water source also to maintain the uh, temperature throughout the uh, study. And if you see the performance, we carried out the performance of this react anaerobic hybrid reactors at four different HRTs, seven, four, three, and two. And when we increase the organic loading rate from 1.43 to five, and usually what happens is when, when by increasing the organic load, there will be a accumulation of volatile fatty acids that might result into drop in pH, but that did not uh, happen in our case. And the performance in terms of uh, VFR alkalinity ratio, COD reduction, methane content, and biogas generation was almost uh, stable up to two-day HRT. And uh, we got the COD reduction was around 84%, and the methane content was found to be uh, 70%. And VFR alkalinity ratio was also 0 0.07, which is uh, suitable for anaerobic uh, digestion. And uh, the solid biofuel production was carried out. We have a machine here at uh, Sprary, the pelleting machine. By using this machine, we produced 8 mm, uh, 8 mm dia pellets. And uh, the calorific value of these pellets was 13.25 megajoule per kg. So these pellets were uh, tried as a fuel using uh, the fourth draft improved biomass cook stove for its a thermal efficiency of the cook stove and also burning rate has been calculated. And we also measured the emissions uh, uh, like CO and uh, total particulate matter were also estimated. They were found to be within the BAS limit. And if you see the thermal efficiency of uh, this uh, first draft cook stove is also meeting the BAS limit. It should be of 35. We got 36 almost nearby. And um, since we have a spready, a spready, we also carried out experiments on bioethanol. So we compared the both the processes um, is a continuous process which we have developed right now and uh, the process which we have already worked on bioethanol and so these are the unit operations that we have considered physical pretreatment enzyme pretreatment and the chemical pretreatment sacrification and fermentation so bioethanol process is taking around 5 days whereas in case of biogas through this route and which is taking only 3.3 days um, even though bioethanol is taking five days, but we all know that both the sugars which are coming out through after enzymatic hydrolysis, uh, there is no single yeast strain which can uh, ferment both the sugars that is C5 and C6. But in case of biogas generation, those sugars can be utilized uh, during anaerobic digestion process. That is an advantage that we have found here. And since we have compared the process, uh, the time and all, we also compared the energy yield uh, by these two routes. And earlier at Spready, we developed a batch process using the paddy to biomethane. And we have a process for bioethanol at lab scale. And we have a now continuous process for a biomethane to, uh, then we compared that, uh, if you see the energy content, the the continuous process had a higher energy content that is 9.48 as compared to the bioethanol rate. We also compared the energy equivalent and the petrol equivalent with the, these three developed processes. So total obtained energy yield from biomethanation route is, uh, is almost 46% more than the uh, bioethanol route. We did a little bit of cost benefit analysis for the 10 ton per day plant. So the based on the biogas generation uh, from the current data, so we can generate around 3,500 meter, meter cube per day of biogas. And we have considered the enriched biogas, we can get around 2450 meter cube per day, uh, considering the 70% of methane. And the biofertilizer generation will be around 3,500 uh, dry, um, dry fertilizer. And uh, price was considered for enriched biogas uh, 46 rupees, and the biofertilizer cost was considered 4 rupees. The capital investment is around 8.2 crores, and uh, operation here we have considered all the anaerobic digesters and also the bottling plant and the the pretreatment reactors and also the sacrification, whatever the uh, requirement is there, that those all those things have been considered here. And operational cost we have considered here, the manpower, the chemicals, enzymes, and uh, also the electricity cost. And the maintenance cost here we have considered as a, at the rate of 3% of the total cost. And uh, the simple payback period is coming around 5.24 years. So 
then the extracted lignin was analyzed for the UVVs and the FTR also to confirm. And we found a shoulder peak at uh, for the standard lignin around uh, 205 nanometer, whereas uh, the uh, the extracted lignin has an aromatic peak of uh, the 295. And the FTR analysis has been done to further confirm the findings. And after the lignin extraction, we also analyzed the uh, compounds present in the aqueous phase also, mostly the acids, phenols, and the benzaldehydes are there, and which are of mainly pomarin and vinyl glycol and uh, for two methyl benzaldehyde. Uh, because this is because of the lignin uh, was, precipitation was carried out uh, by HCL. Maybe that could be the reason the breakdown of lignin has been taken place and that has been released into the aqueous phase. And we also analyzed the data for the derived products and uh, here the relative abundance of all samples. The central line is uh, uh, shown here and extracted lignin showed less deviation, which shows the purity uh, of uh, purity and where the other samples have as, uh, shown has a uh, less uh, deviation here. Carbohydrate to lignin ratio of all the samples revealed that uh, when the pre-treated samples have a uh, higher cellulose and uh, hemicellulose, and lower hemicellulose and cellulose in standard lignin and extracted lignin has been seen here. And if you see the cellulose crystallinity is also has been studied, it is very less in standard lignin and uh, extracted lignin as well. And uh, we, we did the lignin pyrolysis studies at uh, three different temperatures, that is uh, 400, 425, and 450. And we found that maximum we obtained was biochar 55%, bio oil 30%, and pyrogas was around 15% uh, using one kg uh, pyrolysis reactor. And uh, we also analyzed uh, then uh, bio oil and aqueous phase were separated, you separated, and we analyzed uh, both these phases for um, the compounds present in the uh, bio oil phase and the aqueous phase. Mostly they are having benzaldehydes, phenols, and uh, furans. And we did uh, the microbial analysis is uh, anaerobic digestion is a, it's a very complex process and it has uh, uh, acidogenic bacteria and uh, uh, acidogenic bacteria and also methanogenic bacteria. So they are the main um, responsible bacteria for the methane generation and a wide array of bacteria and archaea, they work in a sequential manner and that convert the complex, uh, the biomass into methane rich biogas. So we also studied the abundance and the diversity of these each type of bacteria and their which are crucial for biogas generation and other product formation and the system uh, uh, stability also. So what we found here was methane uh, sieta thermophilic was uh, mostly abundantly available in this reactor which is a prominent archaea and which is a thermophilic in nature and which is responsible for the methane production by using the acetate as a substrate. And in case of bacteria, we have got the thermophilic uh, cultured and uncultured bacteria and uh, the thermomethanobacteria is also present in abundance and that is responsible for the methane production. We also did the taxonomic profiling of these thermophilic anaerobic digesters uh, at the genus and uh, and the abundance, the diversity, and the richness varied because we have collected the samples at different time points uh, within a gap of five hours for 24 hours uh, duration. So initially, the pila of uh, Uri archaeata was in abundance. And later on, um, uh, it, it, the abundance was found to be less uh, after uh, 15 hours of gap because it is maybe the substrate that was fed because it's a continuous process. Every day, we are feeding the material and uh, that might have exhausted. So therefore, the abundance was less there in the later hours of the uh, sample collection. And we also did the functional gene and metag metag metagenomic analysis was uh, 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 done using imputed metagenomic approach. And um, we also studied the role of these microbial communities uh, for uh, sugar metabolism, organic acid, fatty acid, and uh, metabolism and the secondary metabolism as well. So if you come to the conclusion and the process which we have developed has been uh, filed for patent. And uh, if compared to the com conventional process, so converting the straw into biogas usually takes 35 to 40 days. But whereas in this case, only considering the uh, biomethanation part, it is only takes two days. 
and uh, the yield is 43% more as compared to the conventional process and uh, the methane content is also more higher methane content uh, that is uh, 13 to 17%. Um, and as I told that the capital investment was uh, less than 5.24 years and uh, we can get the biofertilizer or you can uh, convert them into biosolid fuel as well. That will surely uh, have an impact on the environmental and biogas produced will certainly be useful in thermal applications, power generation for a capacity, capital uses and uh, or it can be fit to the grid as well. And uh, it has a high CO2 removal rate because of the uh, high rate endrobic reactor we have tried for biomethanation studies and um, good quality pellets of 8 mm size were produced without uh, using any binder. And we also studied the pyrolysis studies of the uh, extracted lignin and the pyrokinetics and the biomicrobial community and the diversity has been explored also. So this holistic approach will lower the uh, negative environmental impact during burning of uh, rice straw in the uh, open field. But the main conclusion is that, however, the implementation of uh, these approaches at pilot scale will require significant process modifications because the experiments that we have done at uh, 100 liter per uh, day uh, in a reactor. So therefore, the bench pilot scale demonstration of these developed strat uh, strategies, uh, strategies would be required to acquire a holistic understanding of implementation challenges because when you go higher scale, there will be so many challenges. It's not that easy to uh, make it uh, more economical. So thank you. I thank once again Dr. Mahalkar and the, the organizers to given me this opportunity to present the work that has been done at Spray. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Madhuri Nara, for a very nice talk. Indeed, uh, uh, you know, valorization of the agro residue that is produced in tremendous quantities is a challenge. We are, uh, I think, probably we are we rank third in the rice production with now our rice production is exceeding even 100 million tons so uh, burning of this all parallel you know uh, the, the bio residue in the fields is creating tremendous pollution especially haryana punjab side and what you have developed is an excellent um, uh, technology for valid validation of this uh, residue for uh, fuel production by by biomethanation that that uh, that is mostly useful for uh, as a domestic fuel. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, and mo uh, very interesting uh, part of uh, your lecture was that, uh, your lecture was that you have uh, uh, that, that, that you have given a very uh, thorough economic analysis of uh, this process. You have indeed uh, uh, like uh, to medium scale investors, okay? eight, eight crore of uh, investment and uh, five years of payback period is indeed a, a, a good picture which shows the feasibility of uh, this process on the commercial scale. But as you have pointed out in the concluding part of your lecture that indeed some translational research is required uh, on large scale and there will be more challenges uh, that, may, uh, that may be encountered as we go for uh, uh, I, uh, on the commercial getting message that I'm not audible. Is it? Is it audio is, is not clear? Yeah, Hello? Yes, sir. it's not audible, sir. It's not clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to... Sorry. Uh, sorry. Just a minute. Switch into this thing. I'm speaking to Android. Huh? Just, uh, just a minute. Huh? Let me see if I can get. Okay, am I edible now? 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 Okay. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Hello, is, is Echo gone now? Yes, sir, Echo is not there. You can continue, please. Okay. 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 Okay
Yeah. Okay, now, now I think uh, huh? Hello? Hello, is it fine? Yes, it's fine now. Please continue. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I, I thank uh, Dr. Madhuri Nara for uh, interesting talk. Well, uh, she has uh, pr presented a very effective method of utilizing the agro residue produced in India. Uh, India indeed, uh, 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 as far as rice straw is concerned, rice production is concerned, I think we rank second or third in the world with our now production crossing 100 million tons. And burning of all this parali or what agro residue in the fields is a major problem in northern India, especially Punjab, Haryana. All that plume that is produced in fields of Punjab and Haryana is polluting air of Delhi. So there is indeed a need for effective valorization of uh, this agro residue. And the uh, um, uh, Dr. Madhuri's talk uh, that the new bioreactor that they have developed for anaerobic digestion it has indeed high potential for effective utilization of uh, uh, this uh, residue. Okay, and most interesting part of uh, uh, the talk was that he, in addition to presenting technical features, he has also given a, a economic account of this new technology. The capital investment of about eight crores and with payback period of five years is indeed a good picture uh, or quite an attractive option. And therefore, there is uh, this basically encourages further study in, in this field. As she rightly pointed out that uh, this analysis is based on 100 liter capacity bioreactor. And as we go on commercial scale, more uh, with larger capacities, more challenges can come. But that translational research will is definitely worth doing as is evident from the economic analysis uh, she has presented. Okay. So thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Madhuri, for a very interesting talk. We uh, now move on to the next speaker. Actually, uh, I'm getting uh, messages of many people are raising hand. So I uh, request that all um, participants should uh, uh, you know, uh, present their questions to the speakers at the end of session. Okay. So let us have now uh, um, uh, completion of all talks and thereafter we'll have a comprehensive uh, q question and answer session okay so that is my request to all audience Where our next speaker is professor kausto mohanti uh, from department of chemical engineering and center for energy uh, iit guwahati uh, the talk of his lecture is wastewater treatment and bioenergy production using a microalgal biorefinery approach i will give a brief introduction of uh, professor mohanti uh, he holds PhD degree in chemical engineering from IIT Kharagpur and is currently working as professor of chemical engineering and head of uh, Center for Energy at IIT Guwahati. His uh, research areas are biofuel, bioseparation, biological wastewater treatment, membrane technology, microalgal biorefinery, and biomass paralysis. He has published more than 150 research, paper, research papers in peer reviewed journals and edited one book on membrane technology and application. He has supervised 13 PhD students and 15 are currently pursuing PhD uh, in his group. He is an associate editor of the Journal of Chemistry, associate editor of the Journal of Institution of Chemical Engineers uh, of India, Series E, and also the Research Journal of uh, Environmental Sciences. Uh, he is a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry UK and also a fellow of Institutions of uh, Engineers India. Okay. So I request uh, uh, Professor Mohanti to deliver his talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohalkar. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk on uh, microalgae based wastewater treatment and uh, simultaneous bioenergy production uh, in a biorefinery uh, approach. So I'll try to keep it within time, uh, of course, uh, uh, make it a short presentation. So uh, uh, some of the slides I'll pass on because of the due to restriction of times. So let us try to understand uh, that uh, uh, we have been uh, hearing this about the about the microalgae cultivation by energy production since few years. 
right so uh, uh, we say it's a clean green and sustainable uh, um, process uh, due to the following things first is that the oil yield is quite superior if you compare with uh, uh, um, non uh, say edible oil production okay uh, it's very uh, it's extremely superior so it do not directly affect the human food chain so basically if you talk about algae it's out it's uh, you can compare little bit with lignocellulosic biomass so it's a, it, there is no question of any food versus feed problem then uh, we can grow it uh, uh, grown it in places that are not uh, arable basically not suitable uh, suitable for the agriculture so you it utilizes carbon dioxide as a source of photosynthesis uh, low cost biofuel with zero waste the process technologies are already established people still are working day and night to make it actually sustainable and economical so microalgae biofuel is non toxic contains no sulfur and is highly biodegradable <clears throat> so uh, this slide will uh, uh, make uh, us understand and that what are the different types of value added products so these are only listed uh, with uh, mostly with respect to energy there are many other okay uh, that we can get from algae so uh, you can go for biochemical conversion chemical conversion you can go for the thermochemical conversion so you can get alcohol based fuels we can get uh, biogas electricity hydrogen we can get diesel of course the oil gets transesterified to get us uh, biodiesel then if you go for htl htc pyrolysis and all this thermochemical conversion we get bio oil or pyrolytic oil char and other things so if it is so uh, uh, so so uh, so good and all then what are the uh, problems current problems that we are facing in basically uh, making it sustainable in economical and a large scale uh, fitting so the first is that we need high volume fresh water it is one of the most important challenge we need to understand that uh, water uh, uh, there is a huge scarcity of water in not only in india uh, some of the parts but also in uh, various other countries then uh, there is a nutrient cost nnp selection of potential strain has been an issue but uh, we have excellent strains now screened by various scientists and researchers then selection of waste water is also a very important thing then we can uh, we have to go for optimization of the waste water treatment because another important thing we need to understand is that whenever talking about waste water based something waste water uh, components uh, composition keeps on varying it also many times dependent on seasonal okay so uh, uh, today there is a rain so your waste water get uh, diluted the components get diluted okay composition basically changes so harvesting uh, uh, is still an issue Uh, with respect to basically uh, less energy intensive and uh, uh, a low cost process then of course conversion of biomass to biofuel is also a pro established protocol but still there are many things to be done so uh, 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 the solution what we are supposed to uh, look at in a broader perspective if you talk about algae based something is that uh, we should talk about algae that should be grown on wastewater okay so why wastewater if uh, it can be any wastewater domestic industrial and uh, so many other type of wastewater are available okay but any uh, wastewater you cannot take and grow algae uh, for a value addition okay so uh, you need to screen it and there are other uh, parameters that need to be uh, talked about so uh, wastewater has uh, uh, depending upon the source has a lot of nutrient source so if you use wastewater many times your cost for supplying nutrition will come down drastically you save a lot of money in that so uh, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration by algae is a uh, established protocol so uh, uh, you use that carbon dioxide uh, from source uh, like uh, the thermal power plants and other uh, industries where uh, it is hugely producing carbon dioxide having said that it's not so easy to do that okay uh, because you have to capture carbon dioxide it's at elevated uh, temperature so you need to cool it down pump it to the respiratory pond so there are uh, process designing challenges engineering aspects basically so then we have to integrate bio refinery for maximum biomass valorization uh, if you look at in any bio refinery uh, bio refinery is always like that if you look at a, actually at a particular one or two uh, value addition bio refinery will never become sustainable so in that respect if you look for value addition in a, a, a multiple different types of uh, products and as well as Uh, so uh, 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 when you talk about a integrated bio refinery i'm talking about that only so first is that there should be uh, a multiple feeds okay refinery should uh, able to process multiple feeds 
Uh, second thing is that there should be multiple te conversion technologies. Third is that there should be multiple products. Some products will be generated in a higher quantity, some will be at a lower quantity, it doesn't matter, okay? So uh, you, some value addition should be there from every waste. And most importantly, if you are growing on wastewater, wastewater after harvesting, that uh, water or culture media, whatever is left out, it still has certain nutrients or value into that. You, you can go for a small sort of uh, treatment and again, recycle back into the culture pond. Okay, so basically reduce, recycle and reuse of solid and liquid waste. Otherwise, it is very difficult to make the microalgae best biofuels sustainable. So this is what we are doing in uh, IIT Guwahati. So integrated wastewater treatment and biofuel production under a biorefinery approach. So we have taken uh, this, the domestic sewage water that is from our sewage treatment plant uh, of IIT Guwahati. We have uh, eight isolated strains. Okay, uh, so we have screened them. Uh, then we have uh, raw domestic sewage, RDSW is raw domestic sewage uh, uh, water. AD is the autoclaved water. And then we have compared our result with uh, 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 control uh, with BG11. So uh, what we have seen that KMC4 is a particular strain uh, of microalgae species that has given a very good result. So we have chosen that. Then we have gone for the biomass uh, culturing. We have harvested it. Then all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, characterization and biofuel production was carried out. So on a, uh, on a, um, a zero waste uh, technology basically, but uh, if you say about zero waste, there is nothing called zero waste. Okay, so basically you reduce waste to certain extent and reuse it so that it's almost your dependency on fresh water becomes extremely uh, 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 low. So I'll just quickly glance through some of these slides. Uh, and these are uh, mostly on the results part. So you can see this, this is the wastewater treatment plant of IIT Guwahati from where we have collected the wastewater, swage wastewater. So uh, then uh, the, you can see there's a huge uh, algal bloom, okay, due to uh, uh, the nutrients that is inherently present inside that uh, um, wastewater, okay. So uh, then we have strain, as I told you, uh, uh, eight strains. So we have found that the KMC4, uh, that is the Mororophidium species, uh, was, uh, uh, was very good for our uh, particular uh, domestic wastewater treatment. So uh, then, of course, we have gone for the growth and screening studies using the three different types of wastewater. The usual uh, the wastewater directly, then the autoclaved wastewater, and the control one, that is the BZ11. So KMC4, this particular monorophidium strain, was found uh, uh, to be potential with 1.47 grams per liter of biomass yield directly from the raw domestic sewage water. So it's not treated, nothing has been removed. It is direct wastewater. Okay. So uh, then we have studied uh, uh, the different nutrient effect and all these things uh, on the uh, process optimization basically. So KMC4 was able to remove 85 to 99% of nutrients from the raw domestic wastewater. Okay, whatever it is already present inherently. Okay, we have not added any nutrient outside. So uh, uh, all these nutrients, you can see uh, on the uh, um, bar chart here, okay, has been removed. Uh, using uh, uh, along with the COD almost close to 90%. It's a nutrient uh, removal profile for this particular species. So then we have gone for some uh, lab scale studies. Then we have tried to uh, uh, scale it up uh, to 25 liter. Then we have gone for uh, auto sedimentation process. Uh, so uh, when we have uh, studied in uh, 13 days of culture period, uh, period uh, so we have seen that uh, uh, there, uh, there is a, a growth of the microalgal biomass uh, yield actually became 2.48, okay, grams per liter. So uh, we have harvested it using a pH of 9.8 using some autoflocculation method. Okay, so then we have also uh, gone for 100 liter where uh, I have not shown here because those are not actually publishable results. So I have skipped those. We have seen, uh, we have also uh, optimized it in a 100 liter photo bioreactor. Now, uh, when we went for uh, uh, this, our uh, head batch system, okay, intermittently uh, increasing the supply of the carbon dioxide, again, also light, uh, light also, uh, the intensity of light. So starting with 2%, 15,000 lux, 
uh, then uh, uh, giving uh, on the seventh day again increasing to four percent carbon dioxide and uh, making the uh, uh, light in uh, lux uh, to thirty thousand. Then uh, again after seven days again, so it is six percent carbon dioxide and light has been increased. So uh, this is a, a continuous process fed by system and we have uh, it has given us good result. So uh, uh, then we have gone for the uh, harvesting. So you, you can see that result actually in the bar chart. So you can see the biomass is continuously uh, increased. Okay, from the plus study, uh, it was almost 1.5. Uh, it has grown, uh, become to, uh, close to 2.5 in the uh, photobioreactor study. And then the same photobioreactor, when it was operated under a fed base mode, it has given us 3.6 gram per liter of biomass. So then we have gone for the uh, uh, harvesting. Okay, oven drying, and we, you can see this uh, uh, green, beautiful image of the algal biomass that was harvested from the fed base system. So uh, then the characterization profile of, uh, uh, so we have gone for this biochemical composition. Uh, you can see 35.8% uh, is protein, followed by 30.3% uh, carbohydrate, and 30% uh, almost lipid. Uh, so uh, uh, then elemental composition and the FEM profile. Uh, this is uh, uh, the FEM profile of the uh, lipid. Okay. So uh, then we have carried out the usual uh, other studies about uh, uh, the, uh, the thermal uh, studies, uh, thermal decomposition profile. Uh, so uh, um, uh, in the uh, uh, presence of nitrogen, so this is pyrolysis. You can see a TGA plot, and this is the combustible uh, combustion profile here again. Okay, so uh, uh, what is interesting uh, part about uh, all this thing is that uh, we have uh, we have a very good amount of uh, uh, this lipid extracted uh, microalgal biomass. Okay, which I am calling as LEMB. So that is liquid extracted uh, microbial biomass that contains huge amount of carbohydrate, proteins, pigments, and unextracted un un lipids. So that what we have used in a more biorefinery perspective to make it uh, so converted using pyrolysis combustion uh, to bio oil, hydrosar, and even bio alcohol. So that's what I'm going to show you in the next slide. So mm, this is what we have done, and it is already done in our lab. So the biomass, this is lipid extracted biomass. Okay, so we have extracted the lipid here. This is the original biomass. We have extracted lipid here. We transesterified and we get the FEM uh, or you can say biodiesel. Then we have hydrolyzed it. Okay, so uh, you, you, you see that is 25 weight percent of sugar here. Okay, so this hydrolysate was uh, converted uh, by the uh, by means of fermentation using Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, so we got bioethanol 1.2 grams per liter. Okay, the, this is little less than other bioethanol yield which are reported in literature. It will happen because you need to understand that this is a waste material. Okay, so uh, from that we are trying to have some value addition. So then uh, without hydrolysis, so we have just uh, uh, sorry, yeah, then the same LEMB, we have again, uh, uh, um, uh, this one uh, used it uh, uh, for the, uh, um, in a hydrothermal reactor. Okay, this is a high pressure, high temperature reactor. So we have got hydrochar, okay, biochar, which is uh, produced as a hydrothermal uh, liquefaction process and uh, equospace contains some sort of organic waste that is the oil part. It is very clearly visible here, okay. So uh, this is what we have done in uh, uh, our lab. And uh, if you look about uh, a more holistic approach of the microalgal based integrated biorefinery, then you need to understand that uh, growing algae uh, throughout the year is also a challenge because it depends, uh, uh, because you have to grow it in raceway ponds or even in photobioreactor also. And uh, out, if you, I'm, I'm especially talking about outside uh, raceway pond. So what happens basically is that there is contamination, there are um, seasonal variations. So every time you cannot expect the same amount of microalgae that has to be produced so that it can goes as a feedstock to the biorefinery. So uh, there is a catch. Okay, so that is the reason we have to decide about some sort of co-feedstock. So in that, our previous, uh, my previous, uh, uh, this one presenters have already talked about the lignocellulogic and different types of waste. So we can talk about the sewage, we can talk about, talk about the domestic food waste, we can talk about the various agricultural waste using the stubble itself. Okay, and various uh, waste. So it's a very uh, uh, holistic approach in which we will be using different types of co feedstocks and then a, a other parts will remain same, different conversion technology and different types of product. So this has to be done. Otherwise, uh, the microalgae biorefinery approach cannot become a sustainable in its own uh, way 
uh, and uh, 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 it, it, it will it cannot be addressed the circular by economy uh, concept so this uh, this we are already doing in our lab okay so i'll just wind up by saying that uh, what we, i have presented uh, a short portion of the, my work our uh, group work so we have uh, screened eight native wastewater stands out of that uh, monorophidium uh, was found to be good uh, it was optimized in pbr and we got a very good biomass yield of 3.6 grams per liter so we have gone for the comprehensive characterization of biomass, so which validates its potential as a bioenergy feedstock. Uh, the uh, liquid extracted microalgal biomass was studied for bioethanol and hydrogel production. Co-feedstock-based biorefinery approach can be considered for further sustainable integrated microalgae biorefinery uh, process. So with this, I, uh, I, uh, I just conclude my talk. These are some of the publications for this particular uh, uh, work. And then uh, I, I must thank CSIR and DBT uh, for uh, funding us for this microalgal uh, research. And thanks to uh, ISEES 2020 organizing committee, Professor Moholka, Professor Singh, and the entire organizing committee of ISS. And thank you very much. So before I conclude, I'll just announce one I'll real a research conference that I'm hosting uh, uh, in next year. It was supposed to be in March, but due to pandemic, we have uh, changed the date. So it will be November 23, 24, 25, 2022. It's in advances in algal uh, research. Uh, research. And uh, uh, so it is jointly hosted by IIT Guwahati, ICT, CSR ICT, GB Pant Agricultural University and the uh, Denmark Technological University. So venue is IIT Guwahati. So uh, you are welcome for this particular, uh, to take part in this particular, um, uh, this one uh, uh, conference. So uh, I wind up, thank you very much. As you know that IIT Guwahati uh, is blessed with a very good uh, uh, campus. So these are some snapshots of uh, our campus. So we do host various conferences ourselves. So we'll be very happy to host you sometime. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Mohalkar also. And over to you, Professor Mohalkar. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Monti, for uh, a very interesting talk. Microalgae are seen as third generation uh, biofuels, the source. First generation was the conventional sugarcane based molasses or, or uh, corn, but now that because of food versus fuel crisis, those substrates are, uh, be, uh, are being proven une uneconomic. So the second generation was the lignocellulic biomass of uh, agro waste and forest uh, residues. And the third one is the microalgal uh, route, which has become pop extremely popular in about uh, last uh, 10 to 15 years. You have given a very nice presentation as how we can couple uh, wastewater treatment as well as bioenergy production. So the both energy and environmental uh, aspects are addressed uh, through the microalgal route. Um, so as you have pointed out, uh, there are several uh, products from microalgal biomass, lipids, bioethanol, and biochar. And uh, the results that you have shown that the yield of about 3.6 gram per liter of biomass in optimized fed batch pack bed reactor is indeed very interesting. And uh, well, again, as I, as I had mentioned uh, after the last talk uh, by Dr. Madhuri, a significant translation research will be required to achieve yes. this uh, commercialization of these features. But at least on the lab scale, these technologies have given very uh, promising uh, results. Uh, that uh, that will encourage uh, further studies. Okay. So Thank thanks again for uh, your talk. And now uh, our last speaker in the session is uh, Professor Ramkrishna Sain. He is presently the head of uh, Department of Biotechnology, and uh, he is also associated with the PK Sina Center for Bioenergy and Renewables at uh, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Okay. Uh, the title of his talk will be vision driven bio inspired journey for achieving some sustainable uh, development goals in areas of energy environment and water uh, i will give a brief bio, bio sketch of uh, dr amkrishna sin he is presently professor and head of department of biotechnology and an associate faculty of the pk sina center for biotechnology and school of energy science and engineering at iit kharagpur he served as a Fulbright visiting professor in the Columbia University in New York. Professor Sain has been engaged in R&D activities in the areas of energy, environment, water, and healthcare with a major focus on green processes and product development in microalgal microbial biorefinery models. 
so far 24 students including two from foreign foreign universities have completed their phd degrees under his guidance and 16 more are pursuing their uh, doctoral studies he has about 235 publications in international and national journals book chapters and conference proceedings and 15 patent applications including three international patents he has also completed 26 sponsored and uh, consultancy projects recently he his he was featured in the world ranking of top 2% of scientists of indian origin he has received several awards and he has also been honored with the distinguished alumnus award of jadavpur university so i request uh, uh, um, professor sen to deliver his talk thank you very much uh, professor moholkar hopefully i am audible and visible as well uh, thank you so much uh, professor moholkar and uh, the organizers of fifth seek uh, thanks for the opportunity and the honor uh, so uh, let me take you through this journey which we had gone through in the last 10 years or so and it has been a vision driven driven journey which was inspired journey which was inspired journey i think there is an echo Yeah. If if you can minimize that. Okay, the catalyst adapter. Okay. Okay. So uh, since it's a journey, I just tell you a story of what how we had gone through. I'm not going to present hard data per se, but I would like to focus more on the scientific policy uh, about uh, you know addressing the sustainable development issues or the goals that our that the United Nations have. Uh, mandated in the last uh, few years so the title is vision driven by inspired journey uh, for achieving some sustainable development goals in the areas of energy environment and water so i hope you are aware or everyone is that the humanity is faced with some global challenges in terms of crisis what we call securities so as we are faced uh, with uh, the you know huge challenges of energy security health security food security environmental security water security and when these securities are threatened definitely there is a clarion call to respond for all of us and that's why Uh, the entire scientific community over the uh, globe uh, is engaged in uh, deriving some sustainable feasible solutions to these challenges as you can see in this slide uh, these are all having nexus in between them one is connected to the other and as you can see that in the united uh, nations forum for climate change the when the thought leaders political leaders government leaders are meeting and thrashing out issues pertaining to these challenges and they are coming up with some kind of you know targets then we are we are you know should be motivated and inspired uh, by by these targets that are set by the government leaders i get some echo i'm sorry i'm getting distracted uh, anyways so as you know these are the sustainable development there are 17 sustainable development goals and out of which uh, maybe uh, my friend and colleague professor mohanty always already made uh, a nice beginning for me and it made my life easy uh, while talking about his research in the area of algal biorefinery uh, could you kindly uh, minimize the volume i am getting an echo again once once again not sure well so Uh, let me go to the next slide so global sustainability in terms of energy economy food water environment these are the targets for the entire humanity and as scientists or, or member of scientific community we are supposed to deliver uh, the solutions to these challenges i hope you are aware of the paris agreement and the accord uh, which was signed by almost 180 plus on countries where we mandated that we will actually work on 
uh, re reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and if possible convert the carbon dioxide or utilize in different ways to make value-added products. And that's how the big question comes how, as to how to enable global economic growth without risking the world's sustainable future. And that's a big challenge uh, before all of us. And as we are, uh, you know, the entire world is increasing in terms of population uh, and there is higher demand for food, fuels, fiber, pharmaceuticals, commodities, and water, whether there is any solution to that. So in that quest, we are actually uh, trying our best in collaboration, of course, we also had to have collaboration with Professor Monty's lab and other labs in India and abroad and to derive these sustainable solutions to the, these global challenges when humanity is at the crossroad. We also prescribe this microalgal biorefinery uh, solution uh, as a holistic model for carbon capture as well as waste to value conversion. So I'll also take you through this journey wherein we have uh, developed microalgal feedstock based uh, some models, uh, model biorefinery. We also have developed yeast based biorefinery, which I'm not uh, going to tell you here. Uh, so wherein we are doing a multiple tasking uh, like biofuel production, production of value added products, including antioxidants, uh, pigments like those are antioxidants, uh, while simultaneously doing carbon capture and uh, you, know, uh, you know, carbon capture from the flue gas. So we generate flue gas in situ and try to capture carbon dioxide from there, grow microalgae and whatever is escaping from the reactor, which is mostly in the open ratio pond because we are targeting biofuels, which is a very large volume, low value product. Uh, so for that, we cannot afford to have very sophisticated photobioreactors. So uh, while carbon capture is one uh, such major goal, we also try to remediate wastes and valorize it into multiple products. So as I take you through this journey, you'll get to see, uh, not in terms of hard data, but some maybe pictures and other publications. And definitely I'll take you through this, uh, you know, some few slides where I would uh, focus on our R&D footprints in energy, environment, water research, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the sustainable development goals. And I'll take questions after that. And there is a po possible way out. Uh, I think everybody is trying uh, to uh, switch over from the linear model of economy to circular carbon economy. That is what is uh, the go of the day. And uh, instead of going through all these, I just tell you a refinery approach would be a kind of a viable a proposition, value proposition for as an alternative, as a solution to uh, the biofuel issues, the renewable energy issues. As you know, in a petroleum refinery, crude is processed to derive multiple products, starting from your LPG, uh, naphtha, then kerosene, then uh, gasoline, then diesel oil, and so on, and at the and bitumen and wax at the at the bottom. Uh, similarly, if you can process, uh, you know these are all market driven. Definitely, if you can process biomass from different sources. Only thing is we have to check the sustainability of the feedstock and then process biomass and derive multiple products out of uh, the same biomass. And then, then we can mimic the petroleum refinery and can make the entire process and proposition uh, very cost uh, uh, competitive and sometimes economically attractive. As the biorefinery solution, Professor Monty has already mentioned, uh, it has evolved over the years as Professor Molkar was also mentioning and my um, previous speakers and colleagues, they also mentioned that there are, these are the challenges about feedstock, feedstock such as sustainability. So we actually have gone through the first stage, uh, biorefinery first stage involving first generation biofuels from, uh, you know, the feedstock which had encroachment uh, and uh, which kind of had uh, common use with food. So they are food stuff cornstarch or you know can molasses i think professor molkar has mentioned already and then we have you know we have shifted the paradigm to second stage where in second generation biofuels came uh, using lignocellulosic uh, biomass as feedstock 
the technological challenges were to you know solubilize, de deconstruct, depolymerize this bi biomass to get rid of lignin, to separate cellulose, hemicellulose, then enzymatically hydrolyze into sugar C5 and C6. Then, then there, there is another challenge posed by the uh, by this development that you have to have a metabolically engineered strain that can grow on both C5 and C6 sugars to give higher yields of ethanol or biobutanol. Biobutanol is considered to be a better fuel in terms of energy density, calorific value, and so on than ethanol. So biobutanol is coming up gradually and replacing bioethanol. Uh, though there are two lobbies, as you know, the oil lobby and the, and the renewable energy lobby. So whichever wins the race, uh, fix, you know, det you know, determines the market forces. Anyways, syn diesel, which is which is an outcome of the Fischer Tropsch synthesis FT uh, process, uh, which uh, involves biomass as well, the dimethyl ether and CNG is you know part of it. Uh, Ma'am, I think mentioned about the biomethanation process, so and that can be leveraged from different wastes, uh, including the straw waste that we get out of uh, our cultivation fields uh, from Punjab and other places. And then uh, again, there were questions uh, raised about their sustainability, whether we can have fit stock with consistent quality and quantity all the time. So Professor Monty mentioned about seasonal uh, issues. There are uh, geopolitical issues as well. So when, when these issues are uh, faced with, then uh, really, we find that the feedstock that we know so far, um, in terms of lignocellulose, the cellulose feedstock, the hardwood, softwood, uh, leaves, and other uh, feedstock, even as people suggested, or did a lot of research on grass materials, miscanthus, switchgrass, we have elephant grass in, in Asia. Uh, but whether they are sustainable, whether we need a lot of land to grow these uh, bi biomass energy crops. For biodiesel, like you know, uh, we, we know Jetropha, Karanja, the biodiesel mission was launched in 2007 and owned up in 2009. Figuring out, figuring out that these uh, you know, feedstock, Karanja, uh, Jetropha, Madhuka, or some other, the full grown trees cannot be sustainable feedstock for biodiesel because it takes time to grow into full plants and then it, it gives seeds. So that takes about three to five years, the digestion period, the industry doesn't want to wait. So that's why all these, you know, we have this learning process and as we have moved up the learning curve, we have switched over from one feedstock to another. And the, the third stage, people started talking about microalgae, uh, though there are macroalgae options, but uh, growing them in reactors is a big issue. Uh, the seaweeds, okay, so one can target a segment of an ocean or a sea and grow them or a rock inside the sea or a little bit on the coastal areas, uh, but they are also not sustainable solutions, but can we develop microalgae which, which can be grown in uh, reactors, in photobioreactors on open raceway ponds, uh, as uh, my colleague Professor Monty mentioned, uh, and uh, sustainably and, uh, you know, uh, leverage the biomass for the production of biofuels, which may include biodiesel, bioethanol, bio oil, all the options have been shown by Professor Monty. We also have gone through that journey in the last 10 years uh, by different you know, reactions like transesterification or uh, physical processes by pyrolysis, hydrothermal liquefaction, pyrolysis with dry biomass, hydrothermal liquefaction with wet biomass and so on. So to derive multiple transportation fuels, liquid fuels options, and also at the same time derive some products uh, which, which can be like biochar is one product, hydrochar is one product which can be used as advanced uh, carbon materials for adsorption and other purposes. And similarly, we also have extracted uh, pigments, butane, which has uh, turned out to be a very good anti-cancer molecule. It's a very good anti antioxidant. Uh, while developing biofertilizers, feed uh, you know, for animals, animal feed, fish feed, and so on. So we have gone ahead and uh, we actually, uh, you know, used uh, flue gas. So we have developed a flue gas generation system by mimicking what is the stack that is there in a, in a thermal power plant. So we, we targeted the point sources. So we have a thermal power plant situated 
close by. It's uh, the place called Kulagat. Uh, and we actually had collaboration for some time with them. We got the heat transfer data. And in collaboration with the mechanical engineering department, we actually designed that uh, you know, flue gas generation system. We got it fabricated and was installed and that uh, worked for us. We generated uh, flue gas, which contained about 12% carbon dioxide. I'll take you through that journey. And then fourth generation, I think uh, Professor Mohankar also mentioned, uh, again, algal biomass feedstock based, but people are talking about more targeted, more focused. So metabolically engineered algae, uh, not uh, really engineered in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the conventional methods, but in terms of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 that has come, genome editing technologies. That means we want to avoid strains which, which are carrying or cultures, uh, engineered cultures, which are carrying antibody resistance genes or markers or heavy metal resistance genes or markers for uh, selection markers, right? So uh, now it can be uh, genome editing based technologies which can offer these uh, 4G uh, algal biofuels, uh, which also targets not only uh, biodiesel, bio oil, but also methanol as one of the outcome. And, uh, you know, the Niti Aayog, I hope you have um, come through, gone through the documents that, that they have published. Uh, that they are predicting, or maybe uh, the scientific community is also predicting that in between fossil fuel economy and biofuel economy, methanol economy will dominate for some time, definitely, uh, before the biofuel options become economically feasible. Right now, uh, as we can afford uh, gasoline, petrol, or diesel, as long as we can afford, we really don't care for bio biofuels, but when we will start, uh, you know, uh, not affording kind of, they are not be affordable, then, then definitely biofuel options, which we are mentioning now, will become um, popular. Well, so these are competitive technology, biorefinery, trained to universal energy carrier uh, for these with multiple purpose of carbon capture and water capture. This means we have to use wastewater, purify it, and, uh, and reuse it. So reuse, reduce and recycle, that's the mantra, that's the, uh, the mandate that many uh, governments are uh, uh, having and also the industries are having. Now, there are certain limitations, though, though we talk about biorefinery, there are certain limitations. Um, the first one that came, food versus fuel, that already uh, we discussed. Then if we actually convert our land into you know, producing biomass for biofuels, then people will ask, uh, where is the land for food crops? So land requirements, land use change, and you know, uh, land availability is a major issue for uh, having this biomass. So that's why algal uh, biorefinery uh, gives such a solution as uh, the production of this biomass in coastal areas while drawing seawater uh, into huge raceway ponds. So you might have seen some of the huge structures that are there in the US. When you fly over Arizona or Texas, you get to see from the flight itself, the huge, huge, you know, a billion liters of uh, you know, capacity uh, of raceway ponds that have been established for multiple purposes, including biofuel. Well, then expensive pretreatment methods that, that is there, expensive not only in terms of cost, in terms of energy as well, because you have to keep in mind how much fossil fuel that we are putting in, uh, you know, how much fossil fuel we are using to derive these alternative solutions. We are using electricity, we are, we are running equipment, conventional equipment, centrifuge, microfiltration units, and some you know, uh, crushing, grinding, uh, yeah, or you know, uh, disrupting equipments which actually draw electricity and that comes from fossil fuels. So definitely all these endeavors must be uh, tagged with, integrated with the solid solar driven electricity uh, the system. Uh, okay, the grid maybe it will take time, but locally it, it can be tagged with, uh, integrated with the solar driven system so that the entire system is uh, renewable or sustainable based on renewable energy. And definitely it's a complex structure because integration we may talk about, but that integration is not seamless. It cannot operate in a very continuous seamless process or seamless way. 
So that is what it's a very complex structure. When we integrate these production processes of say biodiesel, bioethanol, uh, bio oil, all the processes are different and integrating with the same uh, feedstock uh, would be a very, very, uh, you know, challenging task for the industry. So we have to, as, as we are maturing, we are going, growing, definitely we have to give, give the such solutions as, as is required by the industry. So biofuels, why? I think that has been already talked about that this world is running out of oil and the end of oil age was predicted long ago, uh, you know, by the Economist and Time Magazine also came up with an article and 2012, 20, 2008 was kind of the year where the oil production peaked. Uh, so people actually got scared of the uh, future years, but still we are running our civilization based on petroleum and coal. Uh, and uh, people say or predict that uh, this will go on maybe for another 30 years. Uh, 2070 could be the, uh, the year deadline for using petroleum. But before that, it would be so, uh, you know, kind of uh, costly, expensive that we won't be able to afford even beyond 2030. Uh, let's see, I mean, uh, there are, uh, you know, there are options and geopolitical uh, issues actually are more important in this area. So we also mapped the global scenario as far as diplocellulosic biorefinery is concerned uh, as a model and sustainable for sustainable development of biofuels or value-added products. We also looked into the commercial feasibility of lignocellulosic bio, bioethanol and their technology bottlenecks and possible remedies, uh, but uh, we could figure out easily that it is the microalgae which holds the future. Okay, and we have gone through some collaborations which also have taught us the collaboration with UC Berkeley, the Purdue, and also uh, certain other universities. We have a collaboration with the University, the University of Melbourne and the Auckland University. These collaborations also have taught us uh, certain lessons, and we could figure out that microalgae, if we can produce the biomass without uh, uh, compromising with the contamination issues, you know. Uh, so that's why we have developed the process using marine microalgae, uh, microalgal strains, culture, uh, so that and they are not only osmophilic, uh, you know, tolerant to high salinity, but they are also tolerant to high pH. So when you have alkaliphilic, uh, osmophilic strains and thermophilic as well, then you don't need to worry about uh, outdoor contamination. So that's what we have established our biorefinery using this. So the advantages, I think Professor Monty has already uh, discussed, all microalgae versus terrestrial plants. I will not repeat all these, uh, but you know, as we have come off an age and we are prescribing a green microalgal biorefinery, uh, definitely these advantages will work in our favor and not the terrestrial plants. So you know, be it big trees or grasses, uh, so that that we, we may, may not consider right now, but definitely wests which come out of the cultivation uh, processes and methods, definitely they can be uh, utilized and valorized for deriving biofuel solutions. So I'll just take you through quickly our, uh, and uh, let you know about our footprints in algal biorefinery research with a major focus on energy, environment, water nexus, because they are, they are you know, connected very, very intensely to each other. And while talking about that, I also mentioned about our bio microbial biorefinery, wherein we use, uh, you know, bacterial, marine bacterial strains to derive uh, solutions like microbial surfactants, lipopeptides as anti-cancer agents, then probiotics, probioactive molecules, exopolysaccharides, some enzymes, including cellulases, uh, chitinases, and lipases as well. Uh, but I'll just, uh, take, you know, draw your attention to more towards uh, the biomass, uh, algal biomass based biorefinery. For biomass, uh, for biofuels, pigments, for healthcare molecules as a healthcare molecules, and then algal biodiesel. And also, since we cannot uh, switch over overnight from fossil fuel economy, petroleum based economy to uh, biofuel economy, definitely we need to you know, do some more studies uh, to make uh, oil recovery uh, more green, more uh, eco-friendly. 
Uh, so uh, Professor please. Sen, actually, the uh, time is up, so please, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, always. okay, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I'm just uh, taking two more minutes and quickly show you what we have done in this. So, in 3G by biofuels, uh, so water, energy, environment, and health issues are addressed to this, and not all are shown. This is how we process microalgae and derive these solutions. And I just show you some of the, not results, but the outcome, which are visible. Uh, we cultivate in 400 liters. Uh, so before that, we actually grow the seed culture in 30 liter photobioreactor, grow it in uh, 400 liter SO pond. And, you know, we have developed a, a, a kind of a patentable uh, algorithm. It's called uh, the algal biomass dewatering system. It's a conveyor belt kind of a system, as you can see on the right hand side, to uh, dry biomass uh, in just one hour time, which is, which is patented now. Uh, we have called it algorithm to extract, uh, you know, we have actually uh, not, we are not using soft, soft slate nowadays. We are doing in situ transesterification uh, using solvent definitely. And then we uh, extract repeat. So this is done, this was done under CSR Nimitli program. We have established the uh, transesterified products as biofuels because you have to uh, establish uh, based on certain criteria, which are ASTM standards. So this is the pathway that we have followed uh, from uh, the three liter to 30 liter to uh, 400 liter uh, this way pond. And th this is the algorithm I was talking about as a dewatering unit. And we get uh, this solid uh, kind of uh, biomass. And the flue gas generation system that I was mentioning uh, is this, which is connected to a smoke filter, then a scrubber to get rid of socks and NOx. Then we get, get the, uh, the carbon dioxide, which is about 12% of this, and get that spurs into these uh, twin reservoir ponds. One is sample, one is uh, for the production of biomass. One is with air, which is fed with air, another with fed with, uh, you know, yeah. So though this biomass in terms of gram per liter is not that much, you know, high, but these are very old data that I'm showing right now. We have actually come up uh, with the solution and we are getting almost 21 gram per meter square per day, which is kind of aerial productivity uh, with uh, almost three to 3.5 grams per liter for biomass. So I'll, we also have done research uh, using uh, waste, solid waste, liquid waste, and gaseous waste, the flue gas, that we, that's what we treat, and have developed uh, algal biomass based not only biofuel, but purified water. And that, for that, we have got a US patent, which could remove fluorides and microbes, so uh, it can be used as a water filter. Uh, that's a biomass-based green uh, filter. And these are certain you know, publications which show that, uh, that we have certain footprints in this algal biorefinery based uh, technology uh, while connecting our uh, technology to, to produce bioelectricity uh, you know, in the microbial fuel cell model. And uh, also we have developed animal feed, fish feed, and you know, uh, by using the biomass uh, while uh, producing biofuels at the same time simultaneously. And this is the comprehensive graphics that we can see. This is just out of uh, one thesis, my uh, PhD thesis, which has been done, but this was done through two, two projects. So there are about three, four people uh, involved. Uh, Dr. Manoranjan Nayak, uh, who may be there in the audience, and then Dr. Gitanjali Yadav, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, and so on. I acknowledge them uh, for their hard work. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking a little longer. While, while acknowledging, uh, acknowledging, I hope you, you can see this. Yeah. Acknowledging my, all my teachers, my friends, philosophers and guides, all my research students, I named a few uh, who have worked in this area of algal biofuels, algal biorefinery. Uh, my colleagues, collaborators and critics, all the funding agencies, all my family, uh, friends and uh, well-wishers. And finally, the one and infinite, pure and holy, Beyond thought, beyond qualities, I bow down to thee. I thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much, Professor Molkar. Over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Sen. It was quite a nice talk. Uh, you explained the three economies, linear, reuse, and circular economy 
uh, through graphics and then uh, you also gave a good account of how bio refinery should now evolve uh, how, how it should change over time from 2010 to 2020 and then its competition with uh, the other uh, renewable fuels so for, for example those which have come from fischer tropsch synthesis like dimethyl ether methanol or synthetic diesel or the latest one which is hydrogen is the cleanest fuel Yeah, so by refinery limitations also you have pointed out complex structure, expensive pre-treatment methods, land requirement, and finally food versus fuel crisis. So it was quite an informative talk which has given a glimpse. And finally, you also gave an um, account of your own research in the area of uh, microalgal fuels. Okay, so uh, this basically concludes the uh, the uh, the speeches by all eminent speakers. now we shall go for the question answer session about 10 15 minutes um, participants are re requested to uh, raise hands through the chat so i'll call each i can invite them and please uh, an, uh, give a specific like uh, please also name the speaker to whom you are posing the question okay yeah you can also uh, put your question in the q and a box that is there that appears on the uh, uh, bottom of your screen okay uh, uh, prakash binnal hello prakash binnal is there please please uh, uh, yeah hello okay shiva subramanyam v Mr. Shiva Subramanian is there. That's great. He's he's a renowned expert in the area of algal biofuel research. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please, uh, please uh, speak your question, Mr. Uh, Shiva Subramanian. Okay. My mic is on. Hi ah, yes yes you are okay. audible yeah how are you dr sen after a long time i am yes, yes sir i am okay fine thank you so much okay. i hope you all are fine so i just to call you and then see you i ask i i ask i am asking this question what is the status of algal biofuel in your opinion well uh, that, that's what we are discussing here unless we don't work in the bio refinery model we, we we actually cannot offset the cost of production of biofuels so by diesel whatever and between the stand certification and bio crude hstl and what is so, so multiple products that we derive and i think that is what we are doing right now we have we have to derive a very high value low volume product at least one out of this bio refinery yeah we are not to cancel definitely you know when it is a very high value low volume means this has this has a very therapeutic This has therapeutic implications. Otherwise, it cannot be very high value, low volume. So we are we are moving towards that, and we have actually, uh, you know, extracted two such important anti-cancer molecules. One is butene, another we have to decipher in terms of structure, which is a very good antioxidant, uh, though it's not linear to connect uh, the antioxidant activity to anti-cancer activity. So unless we don't add these high value products. Uh, in our uh, uh, production chain, we will not be able to, won't be able to make these uh, bio refineries cost effective. Uh, that is definitely options. That is definitely challenging. It is definitely challenging. It requires a lot of uh, skill and uh, risk. Absolutely. And I'm very happy to see your development with a lot of papers, high impact. I mean, the site has been taken and all that. Very happy. <laughs> so the time is your time. Your time. Your COVID situation. Nice to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being there. Okay, we'll meet on it. Yeah, for listening to us. Thank I you. I so thank the organizers for this. Uh, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is Mr. Prakash Pinnal there? If you are audible, if uh, please, please uh, give your question. Yeah. You need to unmute your mic. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Are you able to hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, my question is: uh, In India, what are the institutions which uh, uh, provide the algae strains for biofuels? Uh, uh, Professor Mohanty can answer probably. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sen can tell better. Most of the <laughs> algae which uh, we have, uh, we are being using. These are all isolated species. 
and uh, deposited to the gin bank and all these things. But uh, I think uh, Antec uh, uh, Chandigarh has a few strengths because they are famous for the bacterial things, but they do also have. I have never acquired any uh, strengths directly, uh, pure strengths, though we got few strengths from IICT. Uh, that's for our research purposes. Uh, so I think Professor Sen can add, uh, tell yeah. us better if he can tell us. Thank you, Professor Mohanty. Uh, Prakash, uh, I hope I can call you by your first name. Uh, there yes. are certain culture collections that were, they are not very extensive, but IARI has a culture collection, algal culture collection in Delhi, in Kusha. And there is a marine algal culture collection uh, that is there in Bharati Dasan University, Tamil Nadu. And there is another, uh, which is mostly a freshwater microalgal culture collection that's there in Manipur. ISBD, the institute name is IBSD or ISBD? Maybe uh, Kosta, we can correct. The institute of IBSD. Uh, IBSD. Uh, that is IBSD, IBSD. So these are standard collection, collections in India. But you can, uh, in fact, uh, procure some cultures from Texas University. They have a culture collection which uh, they, you know, they uh, keep open for uh, the, uh, you know sale as well. So you can buy from them. That's that's a very good, very authentic culture collection with Texas University. Sir, CS, CMCSRI also has. Yes, and well, I, I don't know whether they give it directly or not because for collaboration that we used to buy. Right. So we had collaboration with CSMCRI uh, under this Nimitli program. So we have some mineral yes. cultures. Yeah, but they don't sell. They don't sell. If they deposit in, they have to deposit in these DBTs. Uh, Correct. Correct. Or, yeah, these uh, culture collections. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Akaula, if, uh, if you can unmute and pose, uh, send your question. Mr. Akaula. Uh, he's still, uh, yeah, unmute. Yeah, yeah he's, uh, uh, please unmute your mic. Okay, I think uh, there's some problem. We have a comment from Mr. Muthu Kumar. I'll read out, still the biorefinery is not much commercialized plant like petroleum one. Is there any reason behind it? So what are the bottlenecks uh, that? Yeah, Kostav, uh, Professor Mahanti, if you want to comment. Yes, uh, uh, um, actually, um, we have uh, all our speakers have touched biorefinery in various uh, uh, way, like uh, Professor Gogote, uh, Madam, uh, uh, um, uh, this one uh, also, and Professor Sen and myself. As you know, that uh, there are three things. First is that feedstock. So feedstock uh, availability throughout the year is always a challenge. Even if it is a lignocellulogic biomass also, forget about algae, then also it's a challenge. Because, uh, and uh, feedstocks also has certain, uh, uh, feedstock also varies their composition from place to place. Suppose the straw which you are growing in Gohati or nearby, that composition will be li little different if you are growing it in Tamil Nadu or in Gujarat, because they are soil dependent, right? So algae, not directly like that, but algae also is not sustainable throughout the year. Suppose it is very difficult to grow algae in Northeast places. It's too cold, okay. Uh, but, uh, think about uh, uh, that also. So the environmental and energy factors. So this is one very important thing. Second thing is that process technology optimization. Processes are always available, okay. And, but it needs to be optimized to process multiple feedstock. That's a very in, uh, engineering challenge. Very, very important thing. Third is that as Professor Sen uh, already put out, uh, uh, already told about uh, during this discussion, that uh, even I also touched that we should look for multiple products. Certain products like, let us say, algae or lignocellulogic biomass. So basically we get biochar or bio oil and all these things, na? or uh, biodiesel from the algae if you talk about, but algae is such a, algae is just like a uh, plantain, na? banana tree, okay. Each and every part of it is useful for uh, or eatable or somewhere it is useful. So uh, I'll give something like that. And even lignocellulogic biomass is also like that. You have huge uh, implications of all these uh, uh, this one biomasses, but challenges are there. 
as i pointed out in one one of my uh, slide third or something uh, water is a big problem so water has to be recycled back to the system so that it uh, becomes an integrated bio refinery and as professor sen told uh, professor gogate also told madam also told uh, so uh, uh, all uh, all this has to be economically survivable so this economical part is something very interesting people are still working all of us are working on the ta part and lca part so this has to be done in india okay so but we are hopeful but thing is that uh, uh, process design aspects are uh, still uh, left out uh, strains and uh, this one feed stocks a lot of them has been screened at they are ready uh, to be adapted but it should be a holistic integrated uh, affair otherwise it is going to be difficult and it's not a single challenge there are multiple challenges are there people are working day and night government support is required uh, that i need to touch it also subsidies procuring so many things so slowly slowly it is happening i am hopeful you know uh, nrl numaliga refinery limited is the perhaps first in india if i am not wrong uh, that uh, that is going to uh, establish it's a bpcl uh, subsidiary uh, the establish the first ever bioethanol plant in a large scale okay uh, but please understand that bioethanol is from bamboo okay now many people ask me this question why bamboo bamboo is value added product but bamboo jo use hota tha na pehle for our construction purpose nobody is going to use bamboo as construction purpose everything has moved to steel and all these uh, things right so uh, there are high growing uh, varieties of bamboo which are being planted in the northeast are uh, uh, very fast growing this can be converted to bioethanol so that's a very fast uh, approach by bpcl it is going to be commissioned within two and a half to three years so this is started in india so slowly uh, it will take up right dr muthu kumar okay, i would like to add something to this uh, if uh, uh, like uh, uh, when uh, sometimes ago uh, we had done this uh, economic analysis of biofuel production and we found that about 60% cost production cost is contributed by the substrate so then what is cheap substrate like earlier molasses etc was there but now molasses itself is selling at a price of more 80 say 90 rupees a liter okay so, <laughs> so then came the as a second generation uh, this thing uh, lignocellulosic biomass but a e commerce is growing like straw was available earlier at very cheap rate but now straw has become an excellent packing material if you want to order some crockery uh, from delhi is so sitting in guwahati uh, uh, straw etc has become so there is alternate route so finally what we uh, arrived at was, was the invasive weeds we india has more than 100 150 types of invasive weeds for example water hyacinth which is killing all our water lakes or this uh, arthenium histoporus which is killing all our uh, uh, arable land so this invasive weeds are available at zero cost and more like uh, arthenium histoporus is also harmful to cattle and even as many uh, uh, many humans have this uh, allergy to pollen grain so that biomass which is available at zero cost can be used and more over what we did was a mixed invasive weeds not a single one that is what professor monte was saying that it should it, the more fuel flexible the plant the higher is its viability so we have developed processes for bioethanol and biobutanol are based on mixed invasive weeds and in fact uh, the uh, uh, my phd student who did this work uh, dr arup jyoti bora who is now a uh, assistant professor in tespur university uh, this year he received a young scientist award of iscs uh, for uh, his research so that is what i would like to add now we have a question from mr deepesh kumar and he says is there any india specific Huh? Yeah. Can I add just one one sentence? Yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Respond to yeah. Dr. Muthu Kumar. Uh-huh. Dr. Muthu Kumar, this petroleum refinery, uh, what we see today or maybe for the last uh, a few decades, uh, took almost 50 years to be standardized. So when I, when Rudolf Diesel invented diesel engine, he actually ran the diesel engine in Paris Expo in the year 1913 uh, with peanut oil. Okay. so if that yes, was yes. straight run vegetable oil so uh, that time petroleum uh, refined petroleum was not available so this petroleum refinery if that take uh, took almost uh, 50 years to uh, get standardized optimized and then commercialized uh, with bio uh, with crude oil which was easily available on a platter you know a gift of nature but biomass will take little longer and we have just started the journey right just last 10 yes. 15 years we are talking about uh, uh, bio refinery 
uh, either different biomass, including algal biomass. So we need to wait. And for your information, uh, Solaris Biofuels, Solarzyme, and other companies in the US, they are actually operating biorefinery, producing bio biofuel solutions, along with some high value products. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, we now take a question from Dipesh Kumar. Uh, he's, he's asking, is there any India specific database which can be used for LCS studies? Oh, you want, okay, anybody else? Okay, we, we have actually studied LCA, but uh, definitely not Indian software. We used Sigma Pro, uh, I hope you know that. And there are other softwares available. Uh, one of the publications that I had shown actually has all the LCA aspects covered for biofuels from algae. Uh, so I can uh, send that paper to you. There are two, two papers that have come from our group. Uh, honestly, there is no such Indian. Your, your question is whether Indian software is available, right? Where is the question? Any India specific database? Okay, database, well, that is that will take time again because the funding agencies are collecting data from the PIs and then it, take, it takes time to make a database. So I hope DBT will come up. Uh, after some time, maybe five years down the line, uh, we'll come up with some database from which you can, yes, data, you can take data and use the software uh, to do LCA studies. Right, we have used our own data, vis-a-vis -vis literature data that are available. So we have done that study and published. So thank you, uh, that, that's what I, that's all I can do. Okay, so, uh, well, with this, uh, I thank, hello. Is there any question? I don't see any, any more question here. Uh, there's one question like, uh, what are possibility and feasibility of algal biofuel production for startup company in Tamil Nadu? Well, I think this question has been uh, answered like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Professor Maholkar, may I ask a question? specific question like, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, especially to Professor Paragogate. Yeah, sir, it was a, you had a very wonderful talk on cavitation-based pretreatment and you you already told about the the sonication in, in enzymatic hydrolysis and fermentation. So how effective in enzymatic hydrolysis and how you are practically doing this? Because we have a, a sonication instrument which is having water bath-based and even probe-based. So which is best for this kind of fermentation and enzymatic hydrolysis? That is the first question. And second question is, if you scale up, how effective this, how feasible this sonication-based sonication in fermentation and hydrolysis in large scale? Uh, so thank you, the, Dr. Binod, for that particular question. Uh, so if I look at any enzymatic reactions, typically the ultrasonic bath uh, type system would be more useful because what happens in ultrasonic horn, because you have a direct contact uh, with the liquid, there might be some damage uh, happening to the enzymes. So that controlling the activity will become quite difficult. So I would typically recommend use of uh, ultrasonic bath type system on a lab level. And if you want to scale it up, the same configuration can be typically uh, scaled up in terms of using the indirect mode of irradiation. So it may not be actually bath, but it can be still a cylindrical type reactor where the transducers can be attached to the wall. Similar to what we have in a multiphase reactor where we have jackets. So those jackets can be replaced by ultrasonic transducers. So that is one idea where you want to scale it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Maholkar, there is a question from uh, uh, Madam. Yeah, yeah, Madam, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. No, no, not from my side. From one of the. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ma'am, uh, can you unmute your uh, video? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Yes. Now you here. Yeah. I think now you can ask. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Aradhana is asking something. Aradhana is asking something. Yes. I can read that. Please suggest software for 
metagenomic analysis which software have you used for metagenomic analysis sir i have is asking yeah. about uh, software yeah i already answered the question sir in the question answer box okay 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 uh -huh. Fine. अच्छा इट्स दैट आंसर इज दैट साइड या या आई हैव ऑलरेडी आंसर्ड सर सो सो प्रोफेसर मोहलकर या सो इज आस्क आई विल स्पीक आई डोंट सी आंसर हियर लाइक ऑन द नो इट इज देयर इट इज देयर इट इज देयर देयर आर टैब्स यू हैव टू स्विच द टैब्स यस सो प्रोफेसर मोहलकर कैन यू प्लीज रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल द स्पीकर्स जस्ट फॉर कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स एंड देन वी कैन क्लोज दिस सेशन या 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 यस थैंक यू uh well uh, we are now uh, running out of time so well uh, today's session was very uh, 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 very informative and uh, very we also had a very friendly discussion we our speakers uh, five eminent speakers have touched upon several aspects of uh, energy and environment uh, in which biotechnology can be a solution uh, we started with uh, professor gokte uh, on application of ultrasound in synthesis of bioethanol from uh, west newspaper and she, he also elaborated as how three stages pre treatment hydrolysis and fermentation can be enhanced with application of ultrasound he also spoke about uh, biodiesel through transesterification and interesterification thereafter uh, uh, dr binod uh, uh, talked about production of fine chemicals and polymers specialty chemicals from agri residues and substrates especially he focused on two um, products one three propanediol with lactic acid as a by product and secondly the two five furan dicarboxylic acid he also presented a, a very nice elaborate swot analysis of uh, this particular production then dr madhuri nara from uh, spreri spoke about uh, this uh, basically uh, anaerobic fermentation for biogas production and also the solid residue for fuel pellets uh, uh, she she presented a design of a novel reactor designed by them which has higher yield and faster uh, kinetics moreover the interesting part of her talk was uh, thorough economic analysis of that process in which she gave capital cost operating cost and also the payback period which was 5 years which is which clearly shows that the uh, technology was economically feasible thereafter we um, listened to the talk of professor mohanty who spoke on microalgal cultivation and bioenergy production challenges basically how with waste water treatment and bioenergy production can be coupled he presented idea of that microalgal biorefinery in which liquids extracted from the algae can be substrate for biodiesel production like Uh, biomass can be either converted to char or it can be fermented for the production of uh, bioethanol now uh, the the pack bed reactor they have designed has given indeed a very high yield of biomass the 3.6 gram per liter and finally professor sain ramprasad sain from iit karakpur uh, spoke about the uh, various biorefinery economics like how uh, economies have changed from linear to reuse to circular and then evolution of biorefinery how biorefinery focus should now change with time from over over one decade 2010 to 2020 and finally he also gave an account of uh, research in his own uh, group on production of uh, several biofuels well with this uh, um, it, this indeed was a very informative session that uh, has touched up on all aspects of uh, energy and environment through biotechnology i thank all speakers for sparing time for delivering this talk although it's a difficult period we cannot be physically together this uh, uh, this conference was uh, being organized in jaipur which is a very very beautiful town and uh, it would indeed would have been a not apart from knowledge it would have been a very uh, uh, nice uh, no tourist uh, <laughs> attraction but unfortunately because of covid we are not together physically but well that doesn't uh, hinder the transmission and distribution of knowledge so i think as far as that aspect is concerned I, we have achieved it through today's uh, uh, this session on biotechnology i thank uh, uh, professor avinash agarwal and uh, professor ashok pandey uh, the uh, chairman and uh, deputy chairman of uh, icis and also uh, dr akhilendra singh for uh, uh, giving me an opportunity for organizing this session 
Thank you very much. And also thanks to all participants. I hope uh, these all talks have enriched your knowledge. And please be feel free to communicate with speakers individually. I, that brochure has been circulated for this session and it has all contact details of all speakers. Please feel, feel free uh, to uh, ask any question if you have not been able to ask in this, uh, in this, this particular discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to add one point. So we are going to have a plenary talk uh, by Professor Sandeep Orma, Secretary uh, SERB. So he is going to talk about the funding opportunities from SERB. Uh, so this session will start at 1 p.m. So I will request to all the participants and speakers for joining that session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.